in our family, my grandfather was the first believer. That was the time in between of First and Second World War, and evangelists started to come to Western Ukraine, and New Testaments were available. And my grandfather was the only one in his village who could read and write. So when he got a copy of the Gospel and started to read the Word of God, very quickly he was converted. And not only converted, but he became a local evangelist. There was a passion to preach the Gospel. And very soon he started a new church. He was a pastor and evangelism, evangelist. Unfortunately, he died when my father was just nine years old, so I never met him personally. But my father shared with me two of his pictures. You know, in that time, there were not many possibilities to take pictures, but there was one picture like his head. It's like maybe something like for passport or, or documents. But my real conversion uh, happened when I was almost 15 years old. In that time, it's, it was still the Soviet Union time, and churches were restricted in the activity and uh, churches cannot uh, provide Bible education for children. Uh, we didn't have Sunday school, uh, but some of the leaders, they took risk and they lead our teenagers group weekly. And uh, it was not safe. So we, uh, we knew that we were not supposed to talk on the phone where the next meeting would be. We knew uh, that if during the meeting police would come, we should pretend that we have a birthday party. So that, that was the situation. But of course, as teenagers, we love to come to, to, to be together. But I remember one evening, our leader came and he said, I would like to talk with you about a very important topic how to be being born again. And he started from a very simple question. There were, there were about 30 of us teenagers, and he asked everybody just to tell if we believe we are born again or not yet. And I remember everybody was like say, no, no, no. Some clever guys were kidding and saying like something like, Oh, we are not, but we are close or we are on the way. And only one, only one, and he was my friend. He said, I believe I was born again recently. In fact, I didn't understand, but if it was something important and I didn't know if I had that experience, most probably I didn't have it. So since then, we, we, uh, we started to study what is genuine repentance how it is connected to faith, what it means to be, bo to be uh, born again, uh, what is Christian life, you know, and uh, that, uh, that topics, that evenings, weekly, weekly meetings uh, impressed me deeply. And basically, uh, I started to realize that this is exactly what I need. So it's not enough to be uh, a child born in a Christian family. I should be born again. I should have this personal experience. And I remember that evening when uh, God touched my heart and I, I, I just, I, I was lost in time. I repeated just one word, forgive me, forgive me. And so I was crying and I had that feeling that I'm, I was probably the worst sinner in, in the world. Uh, but then something happened and everything from inside was changed in my heart. It was such a, feeling of joy and love and I just continue to repeat one word but it was not anymore forgive me but thank you Lord and since that evening I knew I was I was born again and it changed my life uh, but uh, the biggest change was that I really started to love the Word of God I read the Bible so often uh, when I was in college and it was boring lecture, I just opened my Bible and read it. I read my Bible just driving a uh, bus to, to the college. I memorized uh, text from the Bible. I really love the Bible. And this love to God and love to the Word of God really shaped me as a young Christian. 
and uh, since then and now i am 52 i just remember that night that courageous leader that brought us to live in faith remember my parents remember the picture of my grandfather and i'm just grateful to god that god saved me and he changed my life and he not only saved me but he raised me as a minister preacher and then pastor and now i am one of the leaders of the baptist union wow it's wonderful in those early days did either you or your family or your church experience much persecution well, when i was a child it, there was not severe persecution uh, because the soviet government wanted to pretend that there is uh, freedom of religion but I remember even from uh, my years in the school, I was ridiculed as a child for a Christian family every time when, for example, we have uh, history lessons. And, you know, and all the history in our school books was built to present the, uh, how Marxism and atheism and of course soviet union government is much much better than all the rest and all the history lessons was like it doesn't matter what period of time religion was on the part of oppressors so every time when we study history lessons about the terrible role of religion in history guess who was invited in front of the class to uh, to share my opinions so i try to be polite i just say what uh, the textbook said but my teacher was not uh, satisfied she always asked after that what is your opinion she knew i was from christian home and so she used this to ridicule me every time in front of my class i remember you know we, we all were pioneers because that was a system from almost from a kindergarten. You, you were just different levels before you became communist, a member of Communist Party. So on that level, we were pioneers with this red uh, plates on our... So I, I, my parents decided, okay, we would not uh, fight with the school, so they let me be pioneer. And I remember one day uh, my teacher came to me they they have been working with us trying to brainstorm our minds uh, regularly maybe once every two two weeks so in that time she invited me and said you should decide either you go with your parents to church or you wear this red stuff i said okay i went back home take it off and never taken on again so then in two days she found i was i was not wearing it it was evident because it, it was like a uniform so she asked me what has happened i said you said i should make a decision i made it so she was she was terrified she realized how that she made a mistake so then i was i was invited to the principal of the school then they called to my parents to the factory where my parents have been working, trying to influence me. And my, my mother was smart. She, she, she took a risk because they could take me from the family. But, you know, she, she was a simple uh, woman, but uh, she was very clever. And she said, you know, I let my child be a pioneer. What did you do? It's your, it's, it, it is not mistake. If you would like to convince my son, please convince him. And they couldn't. So I am, I was <laughs> against the system, against the Soviet Union from my school years. So th this is like a part of what, what it was. I remember it was Easter Sunday. And in that time we had this tradition to have church services very early in the morning. And we got up, you know, as, as children, we really didn't like this, but it was Easter, great celebration. So, but when we uh, came to the church, there was uh, principals and teachers from different schools, and they were standing right in front of the church door. 
And they said to my parents and other parents, you can get in, but your children would not. So parents were arguing, but police was there. So finally, parents said to us, okay, go back home. So they didn't let us to get in to the church service on Easter. So, I, you know, that, that was, that was uh, my experience. The Soviet Union collapsed when I was 21 years old. When I was called to the military service because of my Christian conviction, I said I would not uh, sign an oath that I would give my life for the Soviet Union. I'm a Christian, I would not do that. So they sent me back home after the, from the military service, promising that the next time they will send me right to the Far East to the White Bears. So then in half a year, they called me back to the ministry, but instead of sending me to the Far East Russia, they sent me right in Moscow, right to Moscow. And I was in that uh, military base. And uh, in that time, God, uh, situation started to change. And I had a chance to visit uh, Moscow Central Baptist Church. And then there I have found that new church was found in this uh, suburb of Moscow where my uh, military camp was. So I started to visit that church almost every Sunday. And I remember one Sunday, the pastor said, okay, can you preach next Sunday? I said, wow, I, I have not preached before. I said, well, just, just try. So even in military service of the Soviet Union, I started to preach. And then the church was developing. We started a new church. So they wanted to make something bad to, to us as Christians, but God always turned it into something good. But that, uh, that little persecutions, it was nothing in comparison with what our parents and grandparents experienced in the Soviet Union. But still, it was a great pressure on our minds and our souls. But I, I remember it was like, the stories from the Bible, the Daniel story, Joseph story, Moses story, you know, it was like, okay, <laughs> it's like our life. We were shaped by that stories and we took them as, as it was, because that, that was our time. Now today, you're going through tough days with the war now. Bring us up to date how the church is doing in Ukraine and how ministries like Slavic Gospel Association continue to stand with you during these difficult times of war? You know, when, when, when I think about our experience, humanly speaking, the war is probably the worst that can happen to people or to the nation. When I look back to Ukrainian history, I think the, there is one thing that was even worse. That was the time of famine. The Soviet Union and Stalin organized killing millions of uh, Ukrainians in 1930. Three. But the war is terrible. So we lost territories. We lost a uh, big part of our economy. Uh, our life was destroyed. Uh, we understand that it would not be uh, the same again. It would be, it would be different. 14 million of people left their homes just trying to save their life. Eight millions of them, mainly women and children, yeah. Uh, are abroad. So we have families uh, divided. We have uh, almost one million of men at the military service. We have men being killed and injured every day. We have the, the number of young widows and orphans is growing every day. There is a lot of uncertainty. There is a lot of despair. There is a lot of pain and uh, a lot of blood. Uh, as uh, the Baptist Union, we lost uh, uh, about uh, 230 churches at the occupied territories due to different reasons, but main reason is that everybody had to leave the places, uh, left everything behind, starting their new life and just spread it all around Ukraine and in different countries of European Union. Uh, we lost pastors, 
about 200 pastors and deacons are in the military service. In every single church, we have men at, at the front line. For example, in, in my church in Irpin, 25 men are fighting at, at the war, and we have already have had already four funerals just uh, just in our church. Uh, so uh, people do not know what future holds for them, but people are brave and strong. I, I'm I'm so grateful that Ukrainians are very unique, and no one is going to quit. No one is. Uh, in panic, despite, despite all the difficulties, people are convinced that uh, we should support our army and as Christians we should pray and work hard uh, and to wait from the Lord the date of our victory. We have no doubt that Ukraine would win in this battle and we would have a better future, but we also realize that the way, the road to that day of the victory is uh, it's very, very difficult. And yet, in the midst of this, the church is growing in Ukraine. Yeah. So this is like one part of our uh, human experience when we meet the evil one just face to face. You know, like our president, he said, uh, when he went to Bucha, when Bucha was released from Russians and all these hundreds of dead bodies of civilians were still on the streets, and he said, now I know how hell looks like. I was there today. You know, so the, the reality of evil and the presence of evil and the threat from the evil that came to destroy your life is, is, is terrible. It is existential threat for our nation because we are talking about the attempt of genocide of uh, Ukrainian people. So this is human side, but from the other side, God is still faithful. From the very first day of the war, when we didn't know what would happen, he was working through the Word of God and the uh, Holy Spirit in our hearts. He gave us uh, inside conviction at the end of the first week of the war that Ukraine would survive. And that gave us power to get up every morning, to continue our ministry, uh, to be very realistic, but still encourage churches that okay, God, God is with us. He is still with us. He is crying with us. He is with our soldier, soldiers at the front line. He is with our refugees. He is with our churches when they minister to people and basically convert their premises to shelters or bomb shelters or uh, kitchen to provide meal. But through all of that, God was working uh, in, in Christian hearts and uh, those who stay are face faithful and they uh, they stay strong as humans you know like it's it's not like we are superhero or or we do not know what is fear and despair or other uh, negative emotions we have this every day but by grace but by god's grace we can overcome that to the measure that we not only stay strong ourselves, but our churches can minister to people around them, to share God's love, to bring the message of hope to people. So uh, we see that many churches are full up to capacity, even despite the fact that half of the members left. New people came. When we got statistics from our churches, they gave us numbers that between 25, 30,000 of new people started to come to our churches every single Sunday. More than 3,000 of people have been baptized in our churches last year. And churches reported that most of these people came to church since the beginning of the war. We ordained uh, about 100 new pastors and deacons for the last year. Churches, new churches have been planted and we have the strategy to plant uh, new churches. Thousands of tons of humanitarian aid was uh, distributed, it's still distributed, uh, and we are preparing also uh, to enter the new territories when they would be rescued from Russian army presence, just to, to get in and, and minister. So this is why for us it is important, like Slavic Gospel Association, from the very first day of, of the war, uh, working with us with this very simple but powerful vision and strategy to provide resources to local churches and let local churches to reach people around. This is the best, the fastest way 
to bring help to people in need, to, to, to help them. And it's not only about just distributing the humanitarian aid, it's just creating possibility when Christians can help people, spend time with them, share the gospel with them, pray with them, invite them to their homes or to churches. Thank you.